Since the release of Final Fantasy VII Remake, people have been obsessed not with the game they played, but with where the series is headed, the unknown journey promised at the end of its head-spinning final chapter. I myself have tried my hand at theorizing some predictions for FF7 Rebirth, but in this video I want to take a step back and try to definitively answer exactly why FF7 Remake's creators have seemingly decided to change the story of FF7. To do that, I will have to talk about spoilers for the OG FF7 and Crisis Core, so consider yourself warned. As I mentioned at the start, I made a video last June with some predictions around FF7 Rebirth, and I'm grateful to the nearly 40,000 of you who've watched it and mostly liked it. That said, I'm no longer certain about the exact predictions I made in it, but I still largely believe in its overall philosophy. This video is somewhat of a spiritual successor to that one. To get you caught up, I talked about some of the most popular Zack theories, everything from him saving Aerith to taking over the party after Cloud is lost to the livestream. I concluded with my own theory that Zack wouldn't end up interacting with the main party in Rebirth because the core narrative thrust of FF7 centers on the mystery of Cloud's true backstory. I predicted that Zack would be off on a bit of an unexpected mission that was unrelated to the main party so that he can enter the main events once Cloud had already restored his memories in Part 3. After all, how would the story of FF7 work if Cloud met Zack and found out the truth about his past when his identity crisis is literally how Sephiroth comes to manipulate him throughout the story and enact his ultimate plan? And yes, I still believe that would be important even after the announcement of Crisis Core Reunion, a game that thoroughly spoils the truth of who Zack and Cloud really are. Hell, it spoils it in the damn trailer. I thought maintaining Cloud's confusion about the past was necessary because it seemed the developers were keeping that element of the story intact, both in Remake and in the trailer for Rebirth. Then I played Crisis Core Reunion, a game that Square Enix has heavily marketed to both old fans and first-timers. And I couldn't stand fully by my theory anymore. Crisis Core just gives far too much away. So it got me really wondering about a bigger and more important question than what's going on with Zack. And a question that I don't think people have really dug into. What the hell is Square doing with the remake trilogy? Sure, there are millions of theory videos, some of which take incredibly in-depth dives into the lore and translations of interviews that only a few dozen people have ever bothered looking at but they still mostly focus on unpacking what is happening or what will happen. That's not what I'm really concerned with. To explain, it's time for confession. It wasn't just the release of Crisis Core Reunion that made me think about this. It has been on my mind since the announcement of Crisis Core Reunion itself, and I have been wrestling with its very existence ever since. Given that Crisis Core reveals the truth about Cloud's past, a truth that is treated as a mystery throughout the original game, how could they give that away already? Why destroy that twist? In what way would that improve the story? This isn't me just being precious about a very cool moment. It's the biggest reveal of the original game. Sure, most people know about Aerith's death, but so many don't know the truth about Cloud's past, and for good reason. It's too complicated to be spoiled by a tweet or a simple YouTube thumbnail, and it's still blowing people's minds to this very day. That's what happened! Did he actually kill Sephiroth here? Oh my god! Ah! Oh my god! Bro! Yeah, I remember. He was the fucking god! That is nuts! Oh, man! He was there the entire fucking time! Jesus Christ! Oh, my God. Oh, my God! <laughs> I remember this! Yeah, this is me. I never made it as a member of Soldier, which explains the text we read in the Shinra Mansion. I can't believe what just happened. I can't, I can't, I like, I, this is wild. I, I, no story that I've ever experienced before has taken me on a wild ride like this. I am obsessed with this. 
It is the greatest damn part of the story. Hell, even the developers have said as much. Here's what Tetsuya Nomura, the creative director of the FF7 Remake Trilogy, said when asked which scene stood out most in his memories when thinking back on the game during an interview celebrating FF7's 10th anniversary. Question. It's been 10 years since FF7 was released. What scenes stand out most in your memories as the creators? Quote, the scene that sticks out for me is the scene when Tifa goes into Cloud's mental realm and he remembers the truth about what happened in the past. End quote. Following up on that, here's what Yoshinori Katase, director of the original game and producer of the FF7 Remake Trilogy, said when asked the same question. Quote, Like Nomura, I'd have to say the climax in the mental realm. The scene where the mysteries regarding Sephiroth and Cloud all become clear. End quote. The two main creative voices leading the Final Fantasy VII Remake Trilogy, the producer and overarching creative director, love the livestream sequence where Cloud's past is revealed. If it's such a standout part of the game, how could they spoil it? And for this of all things? No way. He just ate my hair. It made no goddamn sense. Until one day, it did. Let's look at two developer quotes from early 2022. Number one, quote, the crux of the story hasn't changed, end quote. Number two, quote, we fashioned the FF7 remake project such that you finally unravel the mystery of what's going on when you reach the end, end quote. So let's talk about each. What is meant by the, quote, crux of the story hasn't changed? This is a masterclass of deceptive language. For one, story and plot are different things. But most simply, the story is what a game, movie, or book is about, and the plot is the sequence of events that helps you tell that story. Let's use Jurassic Park as an example. The story is about a group of scientists confronting and surviving the world's greatest and most dangerous scientific achievement, witnessing the rebirth of dinosaurs and surviving a night being hunted by them once they are accidentally set loose. The plot is the full sequence of events from first arriving on the island to the moment a T-Rex unexpectedly saves their lives and gives the characters an opportunity to escape. It seems most people, including myself, have been worried about which plot points will change. Aerith dying in the ancient city, Cloud regaining his memory in the livestream, the livestream stopping Meteor, Kate Sith sacrificing himself. Okay, I'm kidding on the last one. We need to put those plot points to bed. If these major plot points were to remain intact, there is very little reason for them to have the party defeat Destiny and lead us on an unknown journey. At least one of those major plot points is bound to dramatically change, if not all of them. In fact, let's take a look at each through the lens of plot versus story. Aerith's death. I think this is part of the core story, not just a plot point. Dealing with loss is a major theme of the story for all the characters, especially for Cloud. But remember how I said the developer quotes are a masterclass in deceptive wording? Remember that. We'll talk about it. In a second. The Livestream Stopping Meteor If this were to still happen, it would mean the culmination of the story is the same. A half-victory over Sephiroth that causes the Livestream to wash over the planet and inadvertently spread Geostigma, which is part of the destiny the party fought to undo at the end of Remake. I think defeating Meteor is an inevitable part of the story, but I don't think it will happen in this way. Let's file this event under plot. Cloud regaining his memory. And here is where things get tricky. The release of Crisis Core Reunion almost certainly puts the livestream sequence with Cloud and Tifa in jeopardy. As cool of a sequence as it is, and as much as the developers have sung its praises for over 20 years, what makes it special is that it is the big reveal of the game's story. You learn the truth that Cloud has been obscuring, and the answer to the mystery that has hung over the journey the entire time even leading to the main character betraying the rest of the party in the Northern Crater. But Crisis Core Reunion completely spoils that reveal. It outright tells everyone that it is actually Zack who travels to Nibelheim as Sephiroth's partner, not Cloud. Hell, as I mentioned earlier, they show that in the trailer for the game, and they've openly told new fans to play Crisis Core Reunion so they're caught up with Zack's backstory in Rebirth. They've even said those new fans could start their remake journey with Rebirth. How could they rob people of that surprise? On the surface, it feels much more than a plot point. It feels structural to the game's story. 
That's when I thought about the developer's quote one more time. Quote, the crux of the story hasn't changed. I've already established that there is a difference between plot and story. So what is the story of FF7? What is the FF7 equivalent to Jurassic Park's story about a group of scientists confronting and surviving the world's greatest and most dangerous scientific achievement? I don't know about you, but I had a hard time trying to come up with as simple of an answer. My mind quickly races to major plot points, and in most summations either feel far too long and meandering, or are too short while leaving out a lot of what makes Final Fantasy VII truly special. This summary from Wikipedia is a blend of both. Quote, the game story follows Cloud Strife, a mercenary who joins an eco-terrorist organization to top a world-controlling megacorporation from using the planet's life essence as an energy source. Events send Cloud and his allies in pursuit of Sephiroth, a former member of the corporation who seeks to destroy the planet. That may be the premise, but not really what the whole story is. So I turn to the game's box, which is wildly abstract. Quote, what begins as a rebellion against an evil corporation becomes much more, and what erupts goes beyond imagination. End quote. That's a bit closer, but more of a tease. So I looked for the instruction book, but it had no summary and just a rundown of characters. Even my own attempts to summarize this story leave me wanting. And don't worry, I'll spare you those attempts. In fact, one of my best friends asked me once to explain why FF7 meant so much to me. He just couldn't get it based on only playing the demo. And it led to a three hour conversation where I took him through every major plot point. And to my surprise, it didn't bore him. It actually fascinated him. There was so much more richness than he expected, but a painstaking three hour run through doesn't meet the Jurassic Park criteria. That said, there is one description of the game story that I think comes closest, and it comes from the game's quote unquote official introduction. Side note, I'm not sure where this introduction lives, but it's been documented in multiple places. This is technically the entire thing, but I'll focus on the final paragraph. Quote, now a small rebel group emanating from the slums must quell the various dangers toward the innocent, and one mercenary for hire must look amidst the lies and deception and find the man he is with them. For me, that story summary unlocks what I believe to be the truth. Let's read a part of it one more time. Quote, one mercenary for hire must look amidst the lies and deception and find the man he is within, end quote. If I were held at gunpoint and asked to summarize what I believe FF7's story to be, it would be that. I might add something like, in an attempt to save the world, but it would otherwise summarize what the story is all about. But remember, the developers didn't say the story hasn't changed. They said the crux of the story hasn't changed. That's when I had an epiphany. The clouds parted, the sun shone down on me, the <laughs> I was on at the time fully kicked in, and I could finally see clearly why the developers would both tease Cloud's unreliable, mysterious memories of the past, while simultaneously revealing the truth of that past via Crisis Core Reunion. It is my belief the crux of the story is its unreliable nature. It is the reveal of the truth that is transformative to players. That's why the live stream sequence is legendary to both OG players and the developers themselves. Revisiting that official story summary one last time, there is one part in particular that stands out after this epiphany. Quote, and one mercenary for hire must look amidst the lies and deception and find the man he is within. End quote. Lies and deception. What could better represent the crux of the story? Not the entire story, but the quote unquote crux of the story better than lies and deception. And when watching the reveal trailer for Rebirth, it's dripping with this idea of lies and deception. What is fact and what is fiction and what is Sephiroth's endgame? Even with all of the crazy VO lines like Tifa asking if someone is implying she died, these lines hinting at a big mystery were reassuring to me as someone who assumed the developers were throwing away the mysteries of the original game. That's because a defining element of FF7's story is unraveling the mysteries behind the lies and deceptions built into the very structure of the story, an element so strong that it's still blowing minds to this day. It's no small part of the story either. One of the building blocks of this video was coming to the realization that the truth of Cloud's past will no longer be the big reveal of the game, especially after having it spoiled by both Hojo and Crisis Core Inu. After sitting with that realization for a while, it was so clear as if this seemed obvious, but they weren't just giving away that mystery, they were replacing it with another, the truth about Zack and the timeline madness teased at the end of Remake. 
But even as I let that sink in, a bigger problem presented itself. Giving up Cloud's mystery removes a foundational element that drives the majority of FF7's story. And this isn't just the purist inside me who loves the livestream sequence talking. In the original game, the truth about Cloud's history and mental state is the key driver of so many major events. Going back to another quote from Katase about the original game, he mentioned once that, quote, in terms of structure, the story is actually divided into three acts. There are three phases to the story that correlate to the protagonist's inner struggle, each with its own core theme. As Katase said, that inner struggle is structural to the story. Without it, Cloud never attacks Aerith, which leads her on a journey to her inevitable death. And without it, Sephiroth never obtains the Black Materia, which eventually leads to the summoning of Meteor, the world-ending event featured in FF7's own title art. That's not a throwaway plot point, it's a titular story element. In fact, when referring to a 10-hour cutdown of all of FF7's story scenes on YouTube, the Nibelheim flashback, where Cloud's unreliable memory first becomes explicitly noticeable, takes place at the 2 hour and 15 minute mark. Cloud doesn't regain his memory and return to the party until nearly the 8 hour and 15 minute mark. That's 6 hours or 60% of the total story. It's one thing to say the developers plan to replace one mystery with another. But it's another thing to say they're planning on removing a mystery that sits at the center of more than half the story. In fact, if you remove the first two hours of Midgard that was already covered in the first FF7 remake game from that 10 hour playthrough, Cloud's mental state dominates the remaining runtime, influencing nearly 80% of the story's content that the trilogy needs to tackle. With all of that in mind, let's put ourselves in the shoes of the developers. You are remaking a game where 80% of the remaining story centers around a mystery that at least half the player base knows in and out. I think most fans wouldn't have a problem with having that story faithfully retold, but it's clear that it wouldn't be creatively fulfilling to the developers. Here's a snippet of an interview with creative director Tatsuya Nomura addressing this very thing. First, the question from the interviewer. Quote, It seems like FF7 Rebirth is all the more poised to share a common crux, yet turn out to be a different game. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask, rather than simply remaking the game using modern technology, you chose to steer the game in such a direction that it might be considered a different title despite having the same crux. Okay, I just need to jump in and say, can we take a second to appreciate how good of a question that was from the interviewer? Just nails it on the head. Like, you keep saying this shit is going to be mostly the same, but also that you don't want to make the same game. So what the hell are y'all doing? Just, ah, my compliments to the chef. Here's Nomura's response. Quote, we are of course aware that some people might think it better simply to leave the original as is and make the presentation more beautiful without changing anything else. However, if that had been the scope, I don't think we would have been able to invest as much in creating it as we have. Back when we first got the project off the ground, we wanted to make sure that even people who played the original game could enjoy new experiences and new narrative developments through its content. That was the task we had to tackle. It begs the question, if OG fans already know the biggest reveal in the story, then how could the developers ever live up to this ambition? Longtime fans like me can yearn as much as we want for our favorite game ever made to be modernized for this era, but it's clear that the developers don't think it would be as satisfying in practice as it seems in theory. Remix producer Yoshinori Katase, the director of the original game, has gone so far as to basically say that he thinks straight remakes can be boring. Here he is, quote, I've had experiences where a game that I loved and had a lot of fun with in the past was remade, and I bought it and played it out of the overwhelming nostalgia. It is enjoyable for a while, but the fun from that nostalgia only really lasts through the first sections. I realized this halfway through and didn't carry on playing. Because of this, I decided that Final Fantasy VII Remake would not just appeal to nostalgia, but would include a new story as well to feel both nostalgic and fresh at the same time. The result of this is that for Part 2 and Part 3, we are able to give fans the excitement of wondering which parts will be 100% faithful to the original and where the new elements will be added. Keep what Katase just said, that when he played remakes for nostalgia, he'd inevitably get bored. In your mind, as I take you through this last quote from the Mora, when you once again played through the mystery of Nibelheim, which is the single most important part of the original game, 
players would get impatient saying, yeah, yeah, I already know all this. In short, the game would only reconfirm the same plot point. Launching such a large project based on that sort of paltry payoff and that gameplay experience would have been difficult. Once again, let's put ourselves in the shoes of the creators. If we're going to go out and try to figure out what they're doing in this game, let's put ourselves in their shoes. You are working with an original story that is propelled by a large mystery. Nearly 80% of what's left centers around that mystery. At least half of the people playing this remake trilogy will either be fans of the original or be new FF7 fans who decide to play the OG while waiting for parts 2 and 3. You personally and creatively feel like any lack of mystery would be unsatisfying for fans who've clamored for a remake for two decades based on your own experience with remakes. When you take all of that into account, it appears that FF7 is undergoing a major change in order to preserve that sense of mystery and surprise that sits at the heart of the story experience. Not the story, mind you, but the experience of the story. That feeling of not knowing what exactly is going on and having that revealed slowly over time, just as the original FF7 did in a way that kept us glued to what was happening, locked into every twist and turn until the truth was revealed. In order for them to do that, however, Relying on Cloud being the unreliable narrator isn't enough. We all know about who Cloud really is. So rather than rely on just an unreliable narrator, they created an unreliable world. In the original FF7, the story was propelled by Cloud's role as an unreliable narrator. Not only did his unreliable recollection of the past cause confusion for us as players, but it directly impacted the journey of the party in their pursuit of Sephiroth. It impacted all players as much as it did the characters in the story. In FF7 Remake, Cloud's role of being the unreliable narrator is being supplanted by this unreliable world, something that can once again impact not only the journey of the characters, but also the journey of all players, not just those who've never played FF7. Whether you played the original or not, everyone who played Remake all asked very similar questions throughout. What the fuck are all these plot ghosts? Why is Cloud seeing flashes of other events? Why is Midgar being domed off by the Whispers? Why are we killing fate? What does Sephiroth mean by seven seconds till the end? Why is there even a different dog on the chips now? All of these questions are coming from the same kind of uncertainty about what's going on that was felt throughout all of our first playthroughs of Final Fantasy VII. It sits at the heart of the story experience that the remake trilogy is trying to create. Number one, an unreliable narrative source remaining as the quote unquote crux of the story but this time coming from the truth about the world itself, rather than just the truth about our main protagonist. Number two, a mystery powered by that unreliable narrative source that fits their ambition to, quote, fashion the FF7 remake project such that you finally unravel the mystery of what's going on when you reach the end. So if you think FF7 Rebirth will give you some answers, expect the opposite. The truth about Cloud's past isn't revealed until the third act of the original FF7, and so I believe the truth about whatever is going on with the world won't be revealed until the third game in this trilogy. What they're cooking up may not be what we want or expect, but it's aiming to make us all say, holy shit, in the same way that the original game did once its original mystery was revealed. That's what they're trying to do. That same feeling that we all had during the live stream sequence, the sequence that we think may be going away or could be going away as we know it. That is the feeling they are trying to replicate for everyone who plays this game, whether you know the original game or you don't. But before you get too frightened about what that can mean, let's make sure I don't just cherry pick quotes. Let's go back to one of the quotes I started to read earlier and finish it. As a reminder, this is the one where Nomura talked about how reconfirming the same plot points would only deliver a quote unquote poultry payoff, where players say to themselves, yeah, yeah, I already know all this. That said, if the story were to change entirely and become something completely different, it would lack any significance. The challenge we've undertaken with this project is introducing new mysteries without straying from the original." End quote. On the surface, this quote feels contradictory to nearly everything I've said in this video, and the developers themselves have said in almost every quote I've referenced. And that's where comparisons to the anime Evangelion come in handy. Over the past two years, I've heard several FF7 fans who are far more hip to anime than me compare Remake to that series. 
So over the past month, I've gone on the journey of watching the entirety of the 90s Evangelion anime and its 2000 series of rebuild movies. First, if you haven't done so, I highly suggest it. For one, it's really easy. The anime series and follow-up movie End of Evangelion are on Netflix, and all four of the rebuild movies are streaming on Amazon Prime. Though, trigger warning, it can be depressing as hell at times, as the creator was battling depression during its creation. I think he comes to some really interesting epiphanies about that depression that really resonated with me and further helped in my own healing, but I still think it's fair to say that it's not a joyful experience. Second, I really loved it, even for someone like me who has only occasionally dipped into anime in my life. I've only seen a handful of the big hitters like Cowboy Bebop, Ghost in the Shell, and Berserk, but that's about it. And still, I found Evangelion to be beautiful, haunting, thought-provoking. A lot of things I didn't expect from an anime that's technically about young teens piloting giant mechs and massive kaiju battles. But Evangelion fans have often talked about how the Rebuild movies seem to be a blueprint for FF7 Remake, and I really wanted to know why. Without getting too deep into it, I see what they mean. In the very first Rebuild movie, the vast majority of events are roughly the same as the first six episodes of the 90s show, but there are a couple moments that are oddly different. And then the final sequence focuses on a character that you don't meet until the final few episodes of the show. It's almost as jarring as Zack scene at the end of Remake. Then movie two has a lot more changes all the way throughout, even ending essentially where the show left off after its original 26 episode run. Then movies three and four explore the characters as we knew them from the show, with many of the same internal struggles and interpersonal conflicts, but set in a different world facing new threats that you can't even really compare to the original show. Literally nothing about the world from the show is left other than its characters. But even still, it all feels of a piece with the original show's story, which continues to explore the loneliness and lack of self-worth that plagued the show's main character, Shinji, just in a completely new setting. Plot points change, the world around the characters change, but the story experience still retains a lot of the core character development and points of conflict from the show. Hell, one character even still gets shot in the same location on their body, just in a whole different context. That said, the very end of the story is quite different from the show, but the progression of the characters and the core story themes are largely the same. Whereas the show's finale draws on its conclusions in abstract ways similar to the end of 2001 A Space Odyssey, the rebuild movies end things in more concrete ways that are more akin to something like Everything Everywhere All at Once, where the hero grapples with similarly big existential questions in over-the-top ways, but it reaches an endpoint that's far more conclusive and grounded than staring at a giant baby in space. That seems to be the line that the FF7 Remake trilogy is trying to walk, trying to explore the same character beats, story themes, and points of conflict just through new moments that will keep us on our toes. But the way the remake devs have repeatedly said it's not changing that much makes me feel that they won't go quite as far as Evangelion. For example, if they really follow the Evangelion model, then the meteor would hit the planet at the end of Rebirth. I don't see something as dramatic as that happening, but I do think the Evangelion rebuild movies do show that you can change major plot points while still telling largely the same story and character journey. I think that story and this whole video is the answer to the question of why is FF7 Remake changing things? They want to truly retain that unreliable narrative core that led to a huge reveal that knocked us all on our asses the first time we played this game. The real question now is, can they pull it off? After all, a revelation this mind-blowing only comes once in a generation, and I hope whatever Nomura, Katase, and the team have in store for us is even half as good. If you made it to this part of the video, thank you so much for letting me talk for so long. I think this is easily going to be my longest video. Um, please share the video around and comment below to let me know what you want to think. Uh, and to help others find this video the way you probably did, it'd help if you dropped a like in order to feed that YouTube algorithm. And real plot twist coming. If you want to see more content from me this year, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. I'm really looking forward to diving more into uh, FF7 topics this year as more information drops. And I'll also be looking forward to talking about more Final Fantasy 16 uh, and other games that I love 
uh, provide some thoughts on them, uh, provide some analysis about what they're all about, what I really love about their stories. Uh, some other games I have sort of back pocket that I want to tackle at some point are The Last of Us Part Two, specifically, because I know there's a lot of thoughts on that game and it's really sat with me for a really long time and I really want to I really want to get my thoughts about it out there at some point. Uh, but that's what you can expect from me. Uh, I hope that you will stick around and get those videos. They may take some time to produce. I do this purely as a side passion. Um, it's not meant to be a news channel. There's a lot of those kinds of channels out there already that I think are, are better suited uh, than this one. And I really want to use this as an opportunity to talk about games um, in a way that I can't otherwise. So uh, hang in there. Um, thank you for watching and hope you subscribe. Uh, hit that like, all that jazz. Um, and I will see you next time.